All right, it's good to have you with us this morning. We are in the book of Revelation, uh, all the way up to chapter 2, and um, we left off looking at the outline of the book of Revelation, which is chapter 1, verse 19, and that's where uh, Jesus tells John to write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. So the things which John saw... Um, Right, the things which you've seen, it's past tense, was the, the vision of Christ in his glorified nature. Uh, he appeared to him, and we saw this amazing picture of Jesus just radiating in his power and authority. His head was like, uh, and his hair glistening white. We're told that his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like uh, bronze that were uh, refined in the fire. It says that his voice was the sound of many waters, like a massive waterfall. Uh, a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, and um, his countenance shining like the sun. So just amazing. And so when this 95-year-old apostle sees Jesus and turns around, he gets this vision of Christ, he just falls over right in front of Jesus. And Jesus laid his right hand on his shoulder and says, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is claiming he is God come in human flesh. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And Jesus had already told John he's going to write um, seven letters to these seven churches, and he's going to write down these words of this prophecy and send them to the seven churches and so that's what chapters 2 and 3 are all about. Write the things which you've seen, past tense. Write the things which are. And we we're told in chapter 1, verse 20, the things which are, are the seven churches. And so that is what we're going to start looking at this week, uh, the things that are, the church age. And, and so Jesus chose these seven specific churches for a very specific reason. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we just ask that you give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. We thank you, Lord, that your word is living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray that you convict us um, of any sin in our lives, Lord, that we would just lay it down before you. And Lord, we just want to grow in our relationship with you, knowing that you love us and care for us. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would bring your word to life within each one of us, that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us through these letters that you have written. And Lord, we just thank you that you are alive forevermore. And it's only because you died on that cross, shed your blood for our sins, that we can have eternal life with you. And so Lord, may we uh, glean from the scriptures the things that you want to tell each and every one of us as a church, but also as individuals. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to go carefully through these seven letters, uh, take one per week, and uh, we'll see Jesus uses a pattern as he speaks specific words to each one of them. Uh, first of all, Jesus will address each church by using one of the features that we saw in chapter 1 of his glorified nature, um, such as the one who has eyes like a flame of fire says this. The one who has a sharp twitched sword coming out of his mouth says that. And so Jesus will speak to us. Um, in these letters to each church. So that's the first thing we see. The second thing he does, he'll tell them, I know your works. And that's both a good thing and it's also a scary thing because he knows our works. You know, he knows what we're doing for him. He knows what we're doing in the flesh. He knows everything about us. He is omniscient. That brings up the third thing we'll see in these letters. Jesus will have words of encouragement and com commendation uh, because of the good things that they are doing, but he will also have words of rebuke and correction because he knows the things where they're messing up. He knows where they're uh, sinning. He knows where uh, they're doing bad works, you might say, that's contrary to God's word, and then Jesus will call those he rebukes to repentance. So repentance is just, it's not just a one-time deal where he tells you repent and then, you know, believe and get saved, but repentance is something we put into practice all the time, not for salvation, but for intimacy with the Lord. 
Um, the fourth pattern that we'll see is Jesus says to all of us who are reading these letters, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so he wants to say something to each one of us as individuals through these letters to these churches. And that means we need to listen up to what, to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us um, because the Lord wants to make necessary adjustments in our lives. And then the fifth thing that he does with each church in his letters, he will tell them this is a promise to those who overcome, to those who put their faith alone in Christ alone. This is a promise to you. So we take what Jesus says and we apply these things to our lives, which is relatively easy <laughs> if you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the weakness of your flesh because you can't do anything Jesus calls you to do in your own strength. We are weak, but he is strong. Now, there's another very interesting thing about these letters. Why these seven churches? After all, they were bigger, more prominent churches in the first century. Um, the only church that he writes a New Testament letter to is the one we'll look at this morning, the church of Ephesus. But as we'll see, Jesus chose these seven churches because they go through various trials, various struggles, uh, various temptations like all churches down through the church age have gone through, the churches today go through. So they're very specific why he chose these seven. Uh, remember the number seven is used 54 times in the book of Revelation. It's the number of completeness, the number of totality. And so through these seven churches, Jesus gives us a complete picture of how he sees the church. These are seven historical churches. They were in present-day Turkey back in the first century. But Jesus is going to use these churches as a barometer, um, as a measuring rod, so that we can see where churches are today. How are we lining up with what Jesus says to the churches? And another amazing thing about these seven churches is I believe it gives us a chronological order of the church down through the ages, starting in the first century, at Pentecost, all the way to the rapture of the church, because in, in some of these letters, he will talk about the rapture. He'll talk about uh, a specific church that doesn't repent, and they'll go into the great tribulation. And so that's obviously speaking of last days. So these churches are still around, but this is an interesting way to look at these seven letters, because as we go down through the history of the church, these seven churches fall in perfect chronological order from the first century to today. Uh, the first church, Ephesus, and even the names are very significant. You know, that's why he chose these as well, because Ephesus means desired ones. And we're going to see that he desires their love. And then he'll come to the second church, which is Smyrna. Smyrna gets its name from myrrh. That was their chief export in Smyrna. Uh, myrrh is a fragrance that you would get when you crushed and ground up a certain plant. And that represents the persecuted church because the church of Smyrna, we'll see, was under very heavy-duty persecution. That particular church 2,000 years ago, but also represents the, the church from the first century to about 313 AD, Smyrna. That's the persecuted church. That's when 10 Roman emperors literally were slaughtering Christians anytime they could get, you know, they, they killed about 6 million Christians during that 250 year period. And Smyrna represents that time, but it's a letter that speaks to persecuted people today. I mean, we have church planters in India today. They're being persecuted. Uh, with this one uh, family, they just got saved over there. Andrew's working in that area um, in Carby, Anglong. And so uh, they got driven out of their village because they got saved and then they get further driven out and then driven out again you know and so they're, they're still facing persecution to this day so that letter will speak to those who are persecuted but then it also brings us to the next church Pergamos that you can pinpoint 313 AD to about 500 AD. This is when Constantine, the emperor, came into power. And some believe he was a Christian. Some say he wasn't. I don't really know. I wasn't there. But uh, he said some interesting things. But he made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
Pergamos means thoroughly married or perverted marriage. And so that is when they force pagans to come into the Christian church, and they brought all their idols. They brought all kinds of false teachings into the church, and that's the church period represented by Pergamos, thoroughly married. They started marrying with the world. And we see churches like that today. They want to be so worldly-minded, they're no heavenly good. What came out of that was from about 500 AD to 1500 AD is the church of Thyatira. So you get a 1,000 years. It's also known as the Dark Ages. Thyatira means perpetual or continual sacrifice. The Church of Rome, even to this day, Jesus gets sacrificed every Mass. Every time they partake of the Mass, Jesus is re-crucified on the cross. And he has some very sharp things to say about that church. But that leads to the next one. In about 1500 AD, the next church is Sardis. Sardis means escaped ones those who came out of that Thyatira system, the Roman Catholic system, that was the Protestant Reformation time. And he'll talk about that system being in play even to the last days. And he's calling them to repentance as well. They have a name that they're alive, but he says they're dead. So they mean escaped ones. The final two churches we'll look at, Philadelphia and Laodicea. They are representing last days churches. Philadelphia is a good, solid church. He says you have little strength, but you've not denied my name. You've kept the faith. Philadelphia means brotherly love. Not like Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, brotherly shove. No, it's brotherly love. And so that's a church we want to emulate. But then the other one that's also parallel to that is Laodicea. Laodicea means people's rights. People's rights. Laodicea, they were being... Uh, they were lording it over others. They're um, not surrendered to God. They're going to tell God what to do. They're going to interpret God's word the way they want it to be interpreted instead of God's way. And so very interesting as we go through all these churches. Again, the most important thing that we need to get from these seven letters from Jesus is this. What is the Lord saying to you and me as individual members of the body of Christ? What is he saying to Calvary Chapel Grand Junction as a church? Because all of us need to have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to our hearts. Saying, what is he saying to our minds? You know, none of us are perfect. And we'll see that very clearly as we go through these seven letters. So judge your own heart by what the Lord tells us in these letters. So chapter 2 Verse 1, it starts off saying, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things, says he, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Right off the bat, we see Jesus holding the seven stars in his right hand. That's the hand of authority. We see Jesus walking in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. We saw in chapter 1, verse 20, that last verse in chapter 1, what this means. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So Jesus is, you know, in the midst of his church. Now, what does this mean to the angel of the church of Ephesus right? Is this a literal angel that oversees our church or any other church? I don't think so. I mean, the Greek word is angelos. Angel is a transliteration of angelos, but it literally means a messenger. Seven times in the New Testament, the word angelos is used of humans, like John the Baptist. He is referred to as a angelos or messenger. Mark chapter 1, verse 2, speaking of John the Baptist, it says, as it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger, Angelos, before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So I believe these seven letters are written to the pastor or bishop, overseer of these seven churches. By the way, angels don't receive, you know, mail from Jesus. They don't. Angels never repent, and he's going to call some of these leaders in the churches to repent. Angels don't repent. They can't repent. Remember when Lucifer took a third of the angels with him in his rebellion? It was one and done. They sinned. There's no second chance for angels. They don't repent. So 
Yeah, I don't think he's talking about literal angels here, but leaders overseeing this church. As a pastor, you know, this is the greatest place I could be in Jesus' right hand. But that's true for all of us. All of us. We are safe and secure in the hands of the Lord. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, Jesus says of you and me, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So we are safe and secure in the hands of the Lord. Now again, the golden lampstands are the churches. Jesus says he walks in the midst of his churches. Now, if we or any church does not recognize the authority of Christ, we don't recognize that Jesus is in our midst and, and that all that we do should glorify him, he will not stick around a church very long. He will leave. And there's a lot of churches in this valley, in this country, in this world, especially in Europe. Jesus is not in the church. They're going through the motions. And we'll see that with Laodicea. He's not in that church, last day's church, Laodicea. He's on the outside knocking on the door. If anybody will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. I'll dine with him and he with me. But he's not in that church because he will not stay where he's not worshipped, where he's not exalted, where he's not honored, where he is not believed, where he is not loved. Now, the church of Ephesus, when you look at this church in the New Testament, this was one of the greatest Christian churches of all time. Uh, you can read about their history, how it was planted and started and you know founded, how it grew. It's in uh, Acts chapters 19 and 20. It was founded by Apollos, this great Greek scholar. Uh, it was built up by this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And then the apostle Paul was used three years he spent in Ephesus, and that church became very strong under his leadership. Timothy... Paul's son in the faith, took over as the, the pastor of that church in Ephesus. And then in his last years, the apostle John, who wrote this, he is there in Ephesus. I mean, you talk about some Christian leadership that was solid, that was, you know, amazing in so many ways. This church could not have any excuse for not walking with the Lord and growing with the Lord. And we're told that the word of the Lord went forth into all of Asia from Ephesus, Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. But it, it spread all over the place because of how strong this church in Ephesus was. Many believe that uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it's one of the great pinnacles of the New Testament. I mean, Paul's letter is amazing. We're, we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're, we're told that this church was just a powerful church. It was a loving church. In Acts chapter 20, we, we see the Apostle Paul giving some very strong warnings about what's going to come down the road to the Ephesian elders as he meets with them one last time, and he thinks he's not going to see them again. So part of what he said, it's found in Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 27. So look at these verses. It says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. This is Paul to the Ephesian elders. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And as we'll see in a moment, this church heeded Paul's warnings. They were solid, doctrinally speaking. So how are they doing according to Jesus? We'll look at verses 2 and 3. Jesus says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Wow, I mean, this is a, a great church. 
This is a powerful church. They're doing exactly what the Apostle Paul commanded them to do. This is a, a wonderful commendation from Jesus to this church. He says, I know your works. The word for know there is oida, which means, and it's in the perfect tense, it means I know and I continue to know your works. What does he know? Well, he knows our works as well. Jesus is commending them for their good works. Now, these are not works for salvation. You know, we're only saved by faith alone and Christ alone. These are works that come out of those who are truly saved. And that's what he's saying. You're doing these good works. As Christians, we know there's still a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of desperate people. There's a lot of people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because they're lost and dying in their sins. So God certainly commends hard work, but only if our work is you know, being done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, we're just doing it in our own efforts, it's just hay, wood, and stubble. It's all going to burn up when we stand before the Lord. He also commends them here for their patience. And patience here refers to those who um, bear up during hard times or under heavy pressure. They have patience under pressure. He then commends them because they cannot bear or endure those who are evil. In other words, they're not tolerating evil in their midst. The Greek word is kakos, K-A-K-O-S. And um, that's important because there's a lot of churches today that are tolerating all kinds of evil practices in their midst. There's a lot of people uh, tolerating all kinds of sinful behavior. And, they'll, and there's churches that will literally say things like, oh, you can come to our church. We don't care what lifestyle you're in. Just come as you are. Jesus loves you as you are, and you're all welcome here. And they never hear the word of God. They never hear the gospel. And so they, their sin is tolerated. Listen, anybody is welcome here in our church, but if you're living in sin, you won't be comfortable here very long. And that's because the Holy Spirit of God will take the word of God and he brings conviction into people's hearts. And people will either repent and get right with God or they'll get frustrated with me and then they'll go to another church and their sins will be tolerated and they'll feel comfortable there. So Jesus commends this church for taking a stand for truth and for righteousness. Notice he also commends them here for testing those who claim to be apostles, but he says they're not. They're, they're liars. Anybody that ever comes in and says, oh, I got a word from the Lord, you better test them to see if they really have a word from the Lord because when I've had people tell me that 99% of the time, it's not a word from the Lord. It's a word from anywhere else but the Lord. And so this church... They're doing exactly what the Apostle Paul exhorted them to do about 35 to 40 years earlier. Well, 35 to 40 years is a long time to get into a rut, get into a routine. I mean, I've been pastoring here 33 years, almost 33 years now, and it's very easy to get into a rut, get into a routine, just go through the motions. So this church, it knew the Word of God. I say, our church knows the word of God. I mean, if somebody claimed to be an apostle or prophet or teacher, you know, this church, they would put them to the test. You know, they wouldn't just believe it because somebody said it. The apostle John says it like this, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And John wrote that around 91, 92 AD. So within 60 years of Jesus ascending, there was already all kinds of false prophets going around the world, going into a lot of Christendom. So we all need God's wisdom. We need his discernment to know what is true, what is false. Wisdom comes from your word, the Bible, God's word. Discernment comes from God's word, the Bible. And so this church, man, they are doctrinally, they are theologically very, very sound. When, when the enemy tried to plant seeds of sin, tried to plant seeds of lies, they stood strong on the Lord by staying true to God's word. 
Paul gives a commendation to the Bereans. You remember the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Paul's there, and he's sharing the gospel with them. And this is what we're told. These were more, this is Acts 17, 11. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So even the Bereans checked out what the Apostle Paul said. They didn't just believe it because it was the Apostle Paul. You go back to the word. This is the final authority, not somebody's opinion. The Bereans checked it out. And so this church of Ephesus, they're doing everything right. And Jesus even tells them here, they have labored for my name's sake. So this is a church I think we'd all want to be part of. This is a church... They took their faith very seriously. They're working hard for the kingdom of God. They're standing upon the truth of God's word. They're, they're doing what the apostle Paul told them to do. But Jesus is the great physician. He can see what we can't see. You know, we think, oh, we can fool God. No, you can't. You might be able to fool others, but you can't fool God. He sees into the very heart of the matter. And what Jesus is now going to say to them takes precedence over everything he's just commended them for. All their good works mean zip, nothing, nada, unless they get verse 4 right. And I can imagine when the pastor receives this letter, and it's from John, and this is a letter from Jesus that John just gave us, and they're reading that, oh, man, we're doing great, we're doing wonderful, you know, God sees our good works. And then when he gets to verse 4, I'm sure there was a gasp from the people there in the church of Ephesus a gasp of disbelief, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. It doesn't say they lost their first love. It says they left their first love. In other words, they've wandered away from God's love. Jesus does not say this church doesn't love him anymore, but what he says here, there's a quality of love that you have left. There's a quality of love that we once had that now has drifted away. You've drifted away from that love. And that's what he refers to, you've left your first love. What does that mean, first love? Well, for us as Christians and Jesus speaking, it refers to that love that you had in your heart when Jesus first saved you. When you became born again, when you knew man, I'm a sinner, and I'm wretched, and Jesus loves me, and he died for my sins. He paid the price for my sins. He delivered me from my garbage that I've been practicing for so long, and now I'm a new creation in Christ. That first love, it's the same word that would be used in a marriage when you first, you know, were engaged. It's that love that is fresh, it's like on your honeymoon, it's everything's new. Everything and everybody takes a back seat to that first love relationship. I guarantee, well, I can't guarantee for you, but I can guarantee for Elizabeth and I, when we're on our honeymoon, we weren't thinking about anybody else. We weren't thinking about anything else. It was just the two of us together, just intimacy. It was amazing. It's the love you had back then that surpassed anything else. And that's what Jesus is saying. You need to get back into that first love relationship with me where there's a thrill, there's an intensity between you and the Lord in marriage between you and your spouse. That's what Jesus is saying to the people here in this Ephesian church. Maybe he's saying that to some of you this morning. Where's that intensity? Where's that passion Where's that thrill of just being in my presence with an open heart and an open Bible? Where is it? Is it still there? Jesus did not save any of you or me because he needed more workers. He didn't save you because he was looking for a bunch of servants. That's not why he saved you. He saved you because he wanted to adopt you into his family as his son, as his daughter, because he loves you. And Jesus simply wants us to return to that intimate relationship that he had with us, that we had with him when we first got saved. Again, all the work we do for Jesus is great, but it can never become more important than the one we're working for. 
It's that simple. Ministry is nothing but busy work. It's just busy work unless it flows out of a heart that is sold out to Jesus. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 13. This is that love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So you can speak in tongues all you want, great, but without love, it's just noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Je Jesus does not want religion from you. He wants a relationship with you. And so we need to get back to that first love relationship. I don't know about you, but I can remember so clearly when I first got saved. I mean, again, everything was new. Everything was excited, exciting. I was a junior at, at San Diego State University, and I got kicked off the baseball team, all that kind of stuff. But I gave my life to Christ, and I was so in love that, this, that Jesus could love somebody like me. And I, I didn't care about school. I'd just get home from school, and I just had to open up the Bible. And I still got my original Bible in my office, just underlining everything, because God was just pouring out his love, his grace, his mercy, his compassion. It's like, I can't get enough of who you are, Lord. He knew how desperate I was. He wants that from you always, where you know how much he loves you, how he went to the cross for you. He rose from the grave for you so that you could have that relationship with him where you know all my sins have passed away. I'm a new creation in Christ. And when I got saved, it was so amazing to discover that he forgave me of all of my sins and he gave me the free gift of everlasting life. <laughs> and do you earn that? Do you deserve that? Do I earn that? No, it's all his gift because of his love, his grace. I was constantly praising the Lord, thanking him for saving a wretch like me, and I quickly discovered Jesus is my best friend. He became one of my only friends because when I got saved and then going back to school, and it's like, Jeff, what got into you? Jesus got into me. I'm a new creation in Christ. I, I love the Lord. He loves a wretch like me. And they're like, okay, bye. <laughs> they didn't want to hear it. But I love Jesus. This is what Jesus is saying here. Where's that love that was there when you first got saved? Where's the relationship that we had in the beginning? You know, why would you ever leave that quality of love for something else or somebody else? You know, this is the same thing that happens in many marriages, marriages that were once so alive, so exciting, or you kind of had goo-goo eyes for one another. <laughs> and then over time, you know, it, it turns into that three ring circus, right? You remember that, the th three ring circus? First there's the engagement ring, then there's the wedder, wedding ring, and then there's the suffering. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> That's how a lot of marriages are. But you know, I love to see, you know, couples have been married. I gotta be careful now because I used to be, oh, the couples have been married a long time, 30, 40 years. We've been married 42 years now. I mean, it's crazy. But you see, I love to see couples that have been married a long time and they're still walking hand in hand. You know, they still have that adventure in their hearts. Let's do things together because they just love each other. If any of this is resonating in your heart this morning, Jesus gives us the, the answer. This is how we rekindle the fire, the passion once again. For him, first and foremost, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is the remedy for a lukewarm heart. Remember, repent, repeat. <laughs> First of all, remember where you have fallen. In other words, remember where you took a detour in your life, where you got sidetracked in your relationship with Christ. 
who or what was it that slowly started pulling you away from that intimacy with Jesus? It can be a person. It can be all kinds of stuff. You know, was it another person? Was it a, a job? Was it the pressure to succeed that became an obstacle? Or maybe the reason why you became too tired? I'm just too tired when I get home from work. I can't open the Bible. I can't pray. I got to get up too early in the morning so I don't open the Bible. I don't pray. I'm not seeking the Lord. I mean, there's so many things that becomes obstacles. We've got to put Jesus first and foremost. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We need to spend that time in his presence, in his word. And once you can identify the problem, then Jesus says, repent. In fact, he says, repent twice in this verse. At first glance, I'm sure as they're hearing this, the church of Ephesus is thinking, repent of what? You just commended us. We're doing all this good work. We're doing all these great things. What do you want us to repent of? We're not living in sin. There's no hidden sin in our lives. Repent. Listen, if we allow anything to get in the way or come between Jesus and us, then we need to stop and repent and start drawing close to Jesus once again. Repentance is not just a one-time deal when you got saved. Yes, we repent. We turn to Christ for salvation. Repentance simply means you turn from going in the wrong direction. You're going this way. And even as believers, we can do something wrong. We repent. We just go back to the Lord. It's not repentance for salvation. It's repentance for intimacy with Jesus. You know, there's some out there that say, oh, you only repent once. And after that, you know, you don't ever have to confess your sin. You're a new creation in Christ. Are you kidding me? And uh, the example I like to use, and I've used it for years now. Okay, I got my marriage certificate. Elizabeth and I got married March 18th, 1980. Got it right. So, and it's in a frame. It's not, but if it's in a frame, it's on our wall. And you know what? We've been married a long time. I'm just going to go to Las Vegas. I'm going to take three months off. I'll leave Elizabeth at home. I'm going to go party. I'm going to go play. I'm going to do whatever I want to do in my flesh. And then I'll come back after three months. So what do you think, Elizabeth? How you doing? I mean, you think I've got an intimate relationship with my wife at that point? Well, we got a marriage license. It's right there in the wall. You better honor that. That's, Jesus doesn't want that. He wants intimacy. He wants that relationship where I don't go wandering off because I love him so much. I love Elizabeth so much. I'm not going to wander off. So we repent. We humble ourselves before the Lord. Because, you know, my position is we're married. My relationship with Elizabeth, if I did that, it's a lousy marriage, right? Jesus doesn't want a lousy relationship. He wants intimate relationship with each one of us. So once you can identify the problem, he tells us, repent. King David understood this. He, you know, got caught up in sin, adultery with Bathsheba. His psalm of repentance is in Psalm 51. And part of that, he simply says in verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation. I mean, can you think back how joyful it was when you got saved? I mean, walking on cloud nine or whatever expression. I mean, to know that you were going to the lake of fire, now you're going to heaven? I didn't know much, but I knew Jesus did a radical change in my life. And he wants to restore to us the joy of his salvation. And he says, uphold me by your generous spirit. In Psalm 139, David writes this in verse 23, Search me, O God, and this is for any saint, any time, and, and know my heart, try me, and know my anxieties or my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. He knows your heart better than you do. So don't think, oh, I can get away with this, I can fool God. No, just search me, show me, rip it out of my life if it's something that's not pleasing to you. And then when the Lord reveals something to you, humble yourself repent of it, because when we do, we will experience cleansing from the Lord, refreshing from the Lord, we'll experience him restoring us back into that place of intimacy with him. And then Jesus says a third thing here, do the first works, which means returning to your first love. 
do the first works, get back into that first love relationship with Christ. And man, when we do, what joy, what peace, what, what love comes flowing out of our lives once again because he's pouring his agape love into us. I can't love Elizabeth the way I'm supposed to. Remember in Ephesians 5, this is the outline for marriage, guys. Husbands, love your wife even as Christ loves the church. That means exactly as Jesus loves the church, you and me, that's how you're to love your wife. And I, I, I can't do that, Lord. And he goes, no, you can't. That's why we come to Jesus. He gives us the Holy Spirit. The, and Aaron prayed it earlier. The fruit of the Spirit is love, agape, love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. I have to go to the source, Jesus. He gives me his agape love to love others, to love my wife, especially the way he loves me. Wives, you won't be submitting to your own husbands as unto the Lord unless you're walking in agape love. If we don't, notice Jesus says he will remove his lampstand from its place. Any church that hardens their heart to Jesus, they might be doing all the doctrinally things right, but their heart is far from the Lord. I'm not going to stick around a loveless church is what he's saying. You guys do your own thing, but if you don't want me and you don't want to keep me first and foremost, I'll split the scene. And that's eventually what happened to the church of Ephesus. You can go visit Ephesus today. There's a lot of ruins. There's no church that's alive there. It doesn't have to happen to us. It doesn't have to happen to Calvary Chapel. We just need to keep our eyes on Jesus, do things his way. Well, look at verse 6. You know Jesus hates something? You're just talking about love. What's all this hate? Well, this isn't hate speech either. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He hates something. Yeah, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, we don't really understand or know exactly who the Nicolaitans are or were, but their name kind of gives it away. Nikeo Laetis. Nikeo means like your Nike shoes to conquer, <laughs> you know, the laity. He hates those who conquer or dominate the laity. He hates those who conquer or dominate their spouse. He hates those who dominate, try to conquer other Christians. He doesn't want that at all. He hates it when someone gets between you and your intimacy with Christ. 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, we know, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is the mediator between us and the Father, not me, not a priest, not some prophet or anybody else. It's us and the Lord. And Jesus says he hates it when someone tries to come between you and and him. Very important. We'll see there's another church they tolerate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, but be that as it may, let's wrap it up. Verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And he says this to all seven churches. He says individually he, means he and she, all of us, he has an ear. You've got at least one, right? Most of you have two. So he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Again, he ends each letter with a promise to those who overcome, to those who put their faith alone in Christ alone. You have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. We'll see this later on in chapter 12. But be that as it may, to those who fully trust in the Lord, we will overcome. We're more than conquerors through him who loves us. And here he says, we will have the privilege of eating from the tree of life that's in the midst of the paradise of God. Where's that tree right now? Well, it's in New Jerusalem. We'll see this in chapter 22, uh, verse 2. The tree of life is there. The river of life flows past it and it produces fruits, 12 different fruit. This is an awesome tree. 12 different fruits, one fruit each month. I don't know how it all works, but it's going to be amazing. So the promise is you overcome, you're going to be with Jesus in paradise, in his presence. 
Where was the tree of life found previously? It was in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. It was in the Garden of Eden. And so somewhere along the lines, God transplanted that tree of life, and now it's in glory in the new Jerusalem. We're going to close here, but just think about that. You know, he put a, a cherubim with flaming swords, you know, to protect the tree of life after Adam and Eve sinned because they chose the wrong fruit, the wrong tree. They fell into sin, and so he puts this uh, angel, this cherubim in front of it to protect them so they wouldn't eat from that tree of life because if they did, they would be in their sins forever and ever. But Jesus would come, he would die, he would shed his blood for our sins. God came after they covered themselves with fig leaves. Think about that. You ever felt a fig leaf? Those things are itchy. That wouldn't be good. But they, they covered themselves with fig leaves, trying to hide their nakedness. And God says, no, he comes and it says he gave them skins. Probably lamb skins. And he puts that upon them. He clothes them. And so how glorious it is to know that if we come to Christ, he will cleanse, he will forgive, he will restore, he will give unto us the joy of our salvation.